My name is Chad Williams and I'm a PhD student at University of Victoria in Dr. Olaf Gagolson's Theoretical and Applied Neuroscience Lab. I'm going to talk about a project we did last year where we went to the High Seas Mars Habitat, which is run by the International Moon Base Alliance, tracking our brain activity with mobile EEG in order to predict our cognitive ability and our propensity to make mistakes. At a quick look ahead, we were able to predict cognitive ability which will inform spaceflight and colonization by using these techniques that we developed and providing it to astronauts when they're in space so that they can determine whether they're cognitively able to make risky decisions. But before I go into the video, I want to highlight the team because I'm just one small part of it. First, we have Dr. Olaf Gregorsen from the University of Victoria. He's the principal investigator of this project. Tom Ferguson and I joined this project as PhD students under Dr. Olaf Kregolson. Next, we have the senior investigator, Dr. Gordon Binstead from the University of British Columbia. We then have collaborator, Dr. Kent Hecker from the University of Calgary, as well as Dr. Michaela Musilova, who was our commander on the High Seas project. My main contribution to this project was developing the algorithm that takes our brain activity and classifies it as our cognitive ability scores. This was an interesting experience because even though we had some ideas going into the HAB, we didn't actually have an algorithm laid out. So I spent every night working hard until I developed an algorithm finally on the third day where we then were able to detect our cognitive ability scores. Now let's get to the video where I describe my experiences in the high seas habitat as well as some preliminary data. Today I'm gonna to talk about how we may be able to predict cognitive ability when people are in extreme environments. Um, and specifically, I'm gonna focus on a research study we did last year where we're talking about space flight and colonization. So a little precursor to the study is that we went to a Mars habitat simulation for a week and we're trying to see if we can actually detect uh, cognitive ability because we want people not to be making mistakes when they're astronauts in space and when they're you know colonizing Mars for example. Um, so the first uh, thing I have here is a still from the movie The Martian um, and if you don't know this movie I'm going to give you a bit of uh, stuff here but it's not really spoilers it's kind of the plot. The plot of the movie is basically an astronaut gets left behind on Mars. Now the reason that this astronaut gets left behind is because a series of mistakes. And the question was, were those mistakes necessary? Or was there a way to really avoid those mistakes by preparing ahead of time? Now, the importance of this research is really to understand when people are able to make decisions and when they shouldn't make decisions. So we're gonna be talking a lot about cognitive ability. And I use electroencephalography, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but we basically track brain activity, and then we can use that to try and detect people's ability. And if their ability is not optimal, then we don't want them making these risky decisions because they're more likely to make mistakes. And in spaceflight and colonization, if people make mistakes, if astronauts make mistakes, then that's literally a life and death situation. So. We don't want that. And that's where the importance of a lot of this research is going to lie. This is Rick Mercer in our lab. And what he's wearing is an EEG cap. So very, very briefly, how does EEG work? So our brain gives off electrical activity. And this electrical activity propagates through the tissues of the scalp and then also the skull as well. And then whatever is left over through that um, ends up on our scalp. So we use electrodes or pieces of metal at different locations on our scalp to actually measure the electrical activity. So if we're using the front of our brain a lot more than the back of our brain, then the electrodes at the front are going to pick up more activity than those in the back and so forth. We can use a lot of different techniques to analyze this data as well and really get a lot out of it. But what does EEG look like? It looks like that. So what we see is from left to right, it's time. And from top to bottom is different electrodes. So each line is corresponding to a different place on the head. And we see a lot of different activity there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna really just start analyzing and processing that data 
to try and predict people's cognitive ability. And then furthermore, um, we can then use that information to try and predict whether they're gonna be able in an environment or not. Now, a lot of what we do is with mobile EEG. So what Rick Mercer here is wearing is not mobile EEG. This is a very standard system and it's uh, very expensive, but what's more important is we can only use it in the laboratory. And that, the reason for that is because we are first off tethered to these computers. So what that means is our participants can't move. So we usually have them sitting in a chair, not moving, not moving their head. And we often even ask them trying not to move their eyes too much. Well, that is pretty good for basic research and we've got a lot of new discoveries and information out of doing it that way. But that doesn't really work in the real world. And there's some research showing that what we find in laboratories is not necessarily what actually occurs in the real world. So if I'm asking you how you make decisions, I put you in a you know, isolated, clean room, um, and then I ask you to make decisions, that really does not correspond all the time with what an astronaut would do in a space shuttle. So one of the issues with uh, these big systems is they, they tether, and they're too, I'm gonna say, unflexible, um, in the sense that we can't bring them into the real world because that's really where we want to know what people are doing. And there has been some work towards making these portable. So here on, what we see is a device where they use the same big system, but instead of tethering someone to a computer, they put a more miniature computer or a laptop, I'm not entirely sure with this system, but in a backpack so they can actually walk around with it. Then that leads us to our second issue with EEG and the big systems is that it takes a long time to put these caps on. Uh, the cap that you see um, on the left specifically can take anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes to put on. Now, what I'm going to show you today is some research we did where we we're in a Mars uh, simulation and we put on a cap and we detect our ability to make decisions or to see if we can make decisions. And that's the whole point. But if we're gonna say, okay, let's see if your cognitive ability is high right now and see if you can make a decision or a risky decision, um, we can't take an hour to do that. We can't set up a system that takes an hour. So what we need is something that's quick and efficient. And that's where portable EEG comes in. Now, especially recently, there's been a huge rise in portable EEG. Everyone is making their own devices and as, engineers, you would know more about it than I would, but essentially it's not a super com complicated device. Now it might be, and I just don't know, but um, what I've heard is you can actually build these pretty simply. Um, now, if you build it simple, it might not work that well. But what we do see with portable devices is there's a range of them. So on the left here, we have a cognionic system which doesn't look that far off from the big system. It is portable, there is no actual cords or anything with it, but it is still pretty complex and it still takes some time to actually apply and put on people. But if you go all the way to the far right, we have the Zeo system, which is basically just a headband. Like that just takes two seconds. Really, there's no complications there. Um, the research I'm gonna talk about today though is the Muse here. So we've used the Muse mostly, and it's as easy as putting on a pair of glasses. So you just put it on and you're ready to go. And instead of setting up for 30 to 60 minutes, now we're talking about 30 seconds at most just to put this device on. So that just completely removes the, you know, the ability or the non-ability to put these in real world environments when we're under time pressures as it is. Unfortunately, these devices do come with limitations, but we're gonna talk about that later um, after I kind of tell you more about our study. So Mars. Um, it's a big thing right now. Uh, SpaceX is really all over the news, especially with Neuralink, which is the new um, device by the same company and all this. Um, and Mars is on the forefront of lots of people's minds. At least it is for me um, because I love space travel. I love the idea of colonization, but I also understand that there's many dangers with this. And I can't say I understand all the dangers, but some of these dangers are things like radiation and weather patterns and debris in space. Things that, you know, personally I, I have less knowledge about, 
and I'm not really too sure how to really deal with that, but as engineers, maybe you do. And we're talking about space travel, so we're talking about engineering spaceships and even, you know, the architecture of buildings when we do colonize. But one really important thing about space travel and colonization that we can never forget is individual factors, human factors. How are humans going to do this? Because what we're saying is we want to send some people to Mars. So there are some different, you know, people that said, we're going to do this. Like there was the Mars One project a long time ago that kind of fizzled away. Uh, SpaceX, for example, as well. And the idea is we're going to send, you know, four or maybe six people through space for a couple of years, then land them on Mars, and then they set up on Mars and then spend time there for, you know, another few years or whatever time span we have. And then they either come home or we send more people. Now, that's a lot of time for human factors to have a lot of impact. And so we need to understand how people are going to behave in small areas because we're talking about spaceships and small light, you know, habitations. And we can't really just expect they're going to live a normal life like we would here where we can go outside anytime we want. So this is the Mars habitat and it takes place in Hawaii or is built in Hawaii. And one reason is because of the lava fields that it's built on. So what you see surrounding it is a lot of, you know, orangey brown rocks, which is actually lava rocks. And that's because of an old uh, lava field. And so the idea of the location for this device or this uh, habitation is that it does mimic Mars in a lot of ways. And when we were in there, it does feel a lot like Mars. Not that I've been to Mars and I would know, but it's the best imagination, my best imagination, it does feel like it. So what we see here is this big bubble. And that bubble is where you're staying. So that's six people is what this habitation houses. And so there's six people in that bubble. You also see a wide array of uh, solar panels. And that is very important. We're going to talk a little bit about power later on. Um, and there's other things here and there, but I'm not going to worry too much about it. But what does it look like inside there? And do remember before I show you, we're talking about six people spending potentially years in space travel and then also in these habitations on Mars. And this is what it looks like. So this is the actual inside of that habitat. And what you see is the main area or the living room, if you will. On the right, you see these desks with some personalized items. And those are just workstations. In the back right is the kitchen, and I'll give you a better shot of the kitchen in a second. Um, upstairs, you see six bedrooms and a bathroom. And then on the left, you see a Doctor Who TARDIS, which actually is also a bathroom. Um, and you don't see it here, but there is another small room behind that, which is a laboratory. And then you have your air hatch, and that's about it. So that's not too much space when you're talking about six people. And so we spent one week in here, and you could already I could already tell you in, in seven days, um, it's, it's a tight space. Um, and they have missions that go for months and with the plan of up to a year or even more in this hab habitat. And that's a lot of close proximity. So there's lots of human factors here. For example, privacy and even creativity and having the ability to drive your own life. And the kitchen might be a good example of that. So when this project started, or this habitation was built, the one issue or one really research topic they were exploring is food and the kitchen. So they first off sent astronauts uh, with these prepackaged meals. Now, a lot of us might think of meals as these like toothpaste type looking food up in space, and that might be true, um, but at least here they're exploring other avenues. And what they first did is they sent just prepackaged food, you throw it in the microwave, you know, three minutes later you have your meal. What they found really quickly is people's, you know, mental health really declined quickly because they kept eating the same food over and over again. And I, I don't know if you're like me, but I like food and I, I, it's an enjoyment of mine. And so you're pretty much wiping away any enjoyment of that at all. So when we were in there and when uh, a few missions before us as well, instead what they would do is they would send Re, uh, freeze dried ingredients. So we have these tubs of ingredients and what that allowed them to do and us to do is make meals. 
and you're, you're more creative and you're making it together and you can get a whole wider diversity of um, different meals, which is gonna really increase mental health because people like to change things up. And um, you could tell how much of a human factor this became because one of the individuals in these simulations actually made a cookbook for meals for Mars and is meant specifically for this habitat um, to help people create more meals here. Um, and it's really a big factor there. Another factor, a human factor, is privacy. So here you see four of the bedrooms and everyone has their own space in this habitat. However, they have done some missions where they're not allowed to close their doors with the intent that there may be some situations when we're in space travel or colonization where privacy is, is not existent at all. But at least for us and for most missions in this habitat, um, they allow privacy. And let me tell you, even again, seven days, six people, um, privacy becomes very important very quickly. And it's really nice to have a little bit of your own space. But of course, you don't have too much space. So we're really getting dressed and doing everything we, we can in here. And these are empty rooms right now. But when you have your own stuff, it gets cluttered quick. So even though you have your own private area, what you need to release your own emotions and your own, you know, health, uh, it's not usually optimal because you're going to be dealing with small quarters at, at best. So another human factor, of course, is privacy and being able to work with each other. Now, I'm going to talk a bit more about other human factors, but one question I'm going to just interlead here with is, why does it matter? So again, we're going to be measuring cognitive ability to see if people are making are able to make proper decisions. And if they're not able to make it, then we're gonna say, well, hold on, you need to hold off and don't make any decisions until you're more able. And the reason why this might be a question is because, well, if anything really major happens, don't you just call ground control and then they tell you what to do anyway? Because the, the truth is with a lot of you know, astronauts, they don't have much personal choice. They just do what they're told. Um, because they have a team of scientists um, on, on Earth telling them what to do. Um, unfortunately, that might work for the moon, but unfortunately with Mars, that doesn't. Because there's a 20-minute delay of communication. And what that means is if you have an emergency on Mars, you can send an email, let's say, and it takes 20 minutes to reach Earth. They then have to find a solution, and then even if they have one immediately, they send it back, and it takes another 20 minutes to get back to you. So it's a 40 minute round trip. So if we're talking about an emergency, you can't rely on ground control on earth because it'll take 40 minutes. And usually if it's an emergency, 40 minutes is much too long. So with here, the idea is that we wanna make sure that astronauts are always ready to make decisions. Um, because if they don't, again, it's life and death and they can't rely on ground control for at least these more mundane or emergency type situations. So it's, all, it's necessary to always be monitoring them before they're making these risky decisions. And of course, if we go to other places like Europa, which is another possible place we can colonize, um, the delay gets longer. And that's that orbits, it's a moon of Jupiter. So that even makes it a 50 minute delay, which, you know, round trip makes it 100 minutes. And that's a lot of time. Other factors include the intensity of what you have to do in these environments. So we're simulating Mars and it's incredible how exhausted we were each day. So here we see uh, Gord Benseta and Tom Ferguson, and I'll tell you about the crew in a moment here, uh, but they're scaling down into lava tubes. So there's a lot of caves in this area uh, that we would crawl through and explore. And you can see already that the ground is not forgiving. So we're not talking about easy strolls when we leave the habitat. We're talking about jagged rocks that can really hurt you really quickly. We're, we're scaling these, you know, really steep hills with really rough and loose rocks everywhere. And it's never a safe situation. And with that said, even though this is in Hawaii, this land is all reserved for this um, high seas habitat. And what that means is that these areas are partially unexplored and also they're not maintained. So anywhere we were walking meant that we could crash through the rocks. So there was always a risk. So when I'm talking about um, 
cognitive ability, that's one example of where is it really necessary. Before you leave the habitat, we need to make sure that you're going to be well equipped mentally to do that. So this is our crew. Um, we were there again for seven days. You see me on the left there. And then there's Gord Binstead from UBC, Tom Ferguson, also from our lab, uh, Kent Hecker from the U University of Calgary, uh, Michaela Misilova from the High Seas Habitat, so this habitat, as well as the University of Hawaii, and then my supervisor, Olaf Kergolson from here. Um, the six of us went in there again for a week. And the idea was we want to measure the brain and see if we can use these measures of the brain to determine how we're gonna behave and how we're gonna make decisions. So I'm gonna show you a task here, and it's gonna be a super simple task. You're gonna see a green dot, and it comes and it goes. And so you're gonna keep seeing a green dot, but eventually this green dot is gonna get frequent, but then we're gonna get a red dot. And so what that means is we're trying to track your ability to be vigilant with your perception and attention. So what this does is we're gonna continuously show you this green dot, but every once in a while, we're gonna show you a red dot. And the bigger your brain response, and I'll show you a brain response in a moment here, but the bigger your brain response, the more vigilant you are to it, which means the more perceptive you were, and the more attention you're provided. And we time lock to this red circle, and we get a brain response that looks like this. Now this is an electrode at the back of our head, but basically we get a dip and then we get a big burst. And the big burst is what we're looking at. We call this the P300 component. And the bigger this component is, the more perceptive you are of this environment. I know it's just dots, but it actually shows us quite a lot of information, but it could be the same thing as if you're walking down a BC trail and then suddenly you see a bear. Now I walk down a lot of trails, um, and sometimes you see bears, but it's pretty infrequent. So my ability to quickly perceive and attend that bear is very necessary for my survival. Maybe not here as much, but um, it is necessary for my survival. And then it's going to be helpful for whether we can make decisions. And this is a little bit more elaborate. So I showed you kind of a, a product of it. But on the left, what we see is a green and a blue line. The green line is really that red dot, whenever we see an infrequent dot. The blue line is, uh, it's kind of backwards, but the blue line is when we see the frequent green dot. So we still get a brain response to the green frequent dot, but we get a much more pronounced brain response to the, um, the red dot, the infrequent dot. And then if we just measure the difference between those two, we get what we see on the right. And then specifically, we're looking right there, that bump, is what we call the P300. And that measures, again, our perceptive and attentive uh, acuity. So why does that matter? So we, you, we started with this component and we did a lot of research um, with fatigue. Now, when I'm talking about cognitive ability, we're saying the higher your cognitive ability, the less likely you're making mistakes. The lower your cognitive ability, the more likely you're gonna make mistakes. Now, when you have a low cognitive ability, it can be partially described by fatigue, but not entirely described by fatigue. So it's more than just fatigue, but that's one component we started off looking at. And what we see is this P300 component is reduced with fatigue. And specifically, we show a correlation here, and some of this data, it's, it's still in prep, so we haven't published it yet, but we find that the longer someone's been awake, the smaller their P300 component is because they're more fatigued. So what we did in the habitat is a little bit more elaborate than that. We had a lot of research ahead of this uh, with fatigue and the P300 component, like I was saying, a little bit more as well on other components. Uh, but what we wanted to do is something a lot more elaborate because the P300 component is surprisingly reliable, but not to the point that we're gonna be sending astronauts out with it. So we wanted to do something a lot more elaborate. So what we wanted to do instead is look at the five dimensions of cognition. So learning, memory, attention, perception, and decision-making. And we did this using two tasks. The one that I already described to you, the oddball task, and then another one, which is a gambling task. I'm not gonna tell you the details, but it's essentially like a slot machine. And using these, we can actually decipher these five different components of cognition by using these elaborate techniques of analyzing EEG. 
Um, one of which, like we see on the top left and we've been talking about, is what we call event-related potentials. Now, ERPs, or event-related potentials, are basically the summation of electrical activity. So if it decreases, that means you have less electrical activity there. Then you get these bursts of electrical activity that rise and then they sink. But we can also look at how the brain responds over a more subtle way. And what happens is our brain regions don't just fire once and then call it quits. They fire and then they fire again and they keep firing. And that's what we see at the bottom is every time that these different waves reach the top, that's another region firing or the same region firing over and over again. We call these oscillations or time frequency analyses. So we're not only looking at these event-related potentials on the top, but we're also looking at these different frequency bands, which implies communication across the brain. And another way of looking at the bottom left, I'm showing you four different uh, frequency bands here, but another way is like this, where we're looking across time um, from left to right, and from top to bottom, we're looking at frequency. So the four I just gave you is kind of a summation of these. But what we see here in red is something we call delta, and it's increasing because it's red. And in blue, we have something called theta, and it's decreasing because it's in blue. And so what we could do is not only use these ERP components, but also these time frequency components. And I didn't want to spend too much time on the dynamics of this, but I could get more into it. Um, but the idea here is we have these two tasks and we're going to be analyzing a lot of different things with the data to get learning, memory, attention, perception, and decision making. Then we're going to put it in a statistical algorithm and then we're going to actually determine cognitive ability. So let's talk about our actual study here, which is that we were in there for seven days, as I've been saying over and over, collecting our actual brain activity. Now here's a promotional shot because we weren't actually, you know, on the surface of Mars collecting our data without our helmets on because we die. And by Mars, I mean Mars. Um, but we actually did it within the HAB, which would be more realistic in the real world anyway. So before you're leaving the habitat, we want to make sure you're doing these really um, elaborate tests. And so we have seven dates, and we collected ourselves at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and so we wanted to measure these five dimensions of cognition at each point and then use a statistical algorithm to see if we can actually detect our cognitive ability. So this is going to be the results and these are again preliminary from our study in the Mars habitat. What you see on the bottom here is it goes from day one to day seven from left to right but each day has three different points the morning, the noon, and the evening. And then this is our cognitive ability score after it's gone through our statistical algorithm. And let's start off with day one. What we see is our cognitive ability is highest in the morning, and then it decreases throughout the day. And again, we were working 14 to 16 hours a day in this habitat, doing physical activities, doing research, doing scientific investigations. We're continuously working. We didn't take a break because we're workaholics. So we really were exhausted by the end of each day. Now the question is, this is a pretty nice trend where it's decreasing throughout the day as we would expect, but does that continue to happen or is this just a spurious result? And what we found is it happened every single day down to if we're looking at individual people, we see the same pattern. This is the six of us all together, but we can see the same pattern within each person. So consistently what we're seeing is in the mornings, we're the most charged and we're most able to make decisions. And as we go through the day, uh, we're getting worse and worse. So the first thing that we might be able to draw from this is maybe if we're going to make these risky decisions, let's do it in the morning. Um, but again, we need some more research. We only have six people here, although they are very reliable results. But we have more investigations to do, but it's pretty interesting. And our future research with the habitat um, would be to collect different people, so additional people, but for longer periods of time. Because again, the whole point of this study was a validation to show that we can do this in the first place. And now that we can, um, we want to really elaborate. We want to collect people. We can only do six at a time because that's as many people that can go in there. But we want to collect people over long periods of time, like months or even years. The question then again, and I've been saying this the whole time, but just to reiterate is, 
why does it matter what their cognitive ability score is? And the reason is if we collect a, a baseline for each person, we can then measure their cognitive ability. And if they don't reach the threshold of their optimal decision making, then we know that something is wrong or they're not optimally able to make decisions. And if this is a risky decision that can, again, be a life or death decision, we need to make sure that we are stopping them from making those decisions until they're ready to. Now, I wrote fatigued here in the sense that um, we are talking about low cognitive ability, but so maybe I should have put low cognitive ability. But the idea is if they're fatigued or not cognitively able, they're going to be below their baseline threshold, which then shows that they're not able to make these decisions as, as well as they could, basically. Doesn't mean they can't make decisions, but they could do better. And we want them to do as best as possible. Um, we've also used other uh, different things like machine learning to actually determine these different components of decision making. So I did say that there's other things we've worked on more than just this space flight and colonization type uh, theme. And one of which is with doctors. So we looked at doctors and nurses prior to and after their shift in the emergency room. And we're able to discern their uh, different data using machine learning um, because they get, of course, much more fatigued after their shift and that looks something like this. So this is actually a simulation. We did it both in a simulation as well as in real emergency rooms in Victoria, Vancouver, and Calgary. And we found that we're able to actually decipher uh, their actual fatigue levels um, where we actually did use fatigue questionnaires for that. And we were able to correlate some of our, our or all of our measures with the questionnaire showing that yes, they are exhausted after a 12 to 14 hour shift in the emergency room, as you might expect. We've also used other areas, like uh, we went up north and we looked at miners, and these miners are driving these trucks that are literally the size of houses. So if they make a mistake, it's, it's really dangerous. So we were measuring that and we found similar results. And we do other things too, for example, we have a baseball study. So we were able to use uh, beta oscillations to predict uh, performance in baseball players in a college baseball team. So we had people do the same tasks actually I talked about, and we looked at beta specifically, and we found that beta was negatively weighted to their performance. So the lower their beta was, the better their performance was. And we concluded that this was because they were in a, a state of flow. So they're in the zone. So those that were in the zone performed better. So we can actually predict future performance in athletes as well. Now, I said at the start that these have some limitations. So let's get into those here. This is probably more what you're interested in because you're in engineering. Um, and one of the first things is the fit. Now, these devices uh, have put a lot of work into trying to get the best data and the best whatnot. But one thing that is still lacking is fit. So the Muse specifically, as an example, doesn't fit everybody. So some people, it's too big for their head at all, and it just falls off. Others, it's too small, and you can't wrap it around in the right locations. Now, with the zero on the bottom right, it's a little bit more flexible with, with that, but still, we're talking about trying to get different parts of the head, and we can only do that as accurately as the device lets us. So to my opinion, there is still some need of work for all of these devices entirely. Um, also battery. So I, when I showed you the Mars habitat, there was this big solar panel. And what that meant was we're completely solar energy there. And of course that makes sense. And unfortunately that means we need to not drain our batteries. So with the big system um, that we used that was on Rick Mercer, the problem with that is that it's always plugged in, always drawing power. Now that doesn't work when we're trying to conserve power. And even when we're in the habitat, we did everything we can to not use power as much as we possibly could. And lots of days we had no lights on most of the day, even though it was dark, just because we didn't want to lose power. And we actually did lose power a couple of times. So if a device is charging every night, like we did with the Muse, although it can last more than just one day, we didn't want to compromise our study, um, then it's a problem. But if the Muse or whatever device we end up using uh, takes 
has batteries for months, then we don't need to worry about its power draw. And then finally, the biggest issue with these devices is Bluetooth. So the way it works is we use these devices and they send data through Bluetooth to a tablet in our case, or like a computer or something like that. And what that means is we get variable timing with our data packages. So if you know much about Bluetooth, it's not reliable on timing. And what that actually does and we know this, even though we still get these ERP components and these time frequency components, it's to a reduced effect. So we're getting diminished effects and they're less reliable. They're still, they still work, but they're less reliable. So the Cognionic system on the far left there actually has a way to record data within the device itself so that we can just circumvent this whole issue altogether. But then we have to transfer the data and we want to be really detecting people's cognitive scores in real time. So when we're doing that through Bluetooth, it's a big limitation because we're getting less reliable results. It's still okay, but it's not 100%. And still, when we're talking about you know, space flight and colonization, we don't want any degree of error. We want as little as possible. So anything that makes it less reliable is not good. So these devices all are working towards removing the idea of unreliable packages and really need to work on making sure our data is as reliable and our quality is as good as possible. The point here is we collected with a Cognionic system, so this isn't Muse, we collected data on the same person, same experiment, same device, three different softwares and we're getting different results. So not only do we need to really prime and figure out what hardware to use, which devices to use, but we need to also understand how they're being recorded in these, these uh, software. Um, furthermore, I also use these statistical algorithms in um, the Mars habitat, but we also have used machine learning. So the next thing is, well, what analysis do we do? And then finally, as someone already pointed out today, how do we interpret all these things? So I'm showing here cognitive ability, and we already discussed this because of a great question. Um, but what does that mean? And until we get a lot more, a battery of, of questionnaires and, and measures, we don't know really what it means. So there's a lot for us to go through here. So we need to know what hardware to use. We need to optimize our hardware. We need to optimize our software. We need to optimize our uh, analysis techniques. And then we need to understand how to interpret this data. I just want to thank all the collaborators and leave the presentation here with a picture of us um, in a Mars excavation. We're in a lava tube watching Star Wars.